Hey, let's do it for the content. Mega Ray. Let's go. Let's get it. Dick Kick City. It gets gritty when Mega Ray come through. The kid gets busy. Work yourself into a shoot, but you know it's legit. Like what you like, just don't be a dick. Hey, wrestling with regret. Let's get it. What's that set? Maybe you should bottle it. Drink it and spray it on. Get going to model it. Eight years in, can't look back. Who else can make the lost sweatsuits look whack? Wrestling with regret. Let's get it. Yeah. Factions, stables, call them what you will, but putting a bunch of wrestlers together in a big group is one of the most effective, time-tested ways to get a bunch of people over with the crowd at one time. You know all the famous ones. The Horsemen, the Heenan Family, the New World Order, Degeneration X, Bullet Club, The Shield, The New Day, The Union. Okay, okay, you caught me there. Wrestling's rich tapestry is filled to the brim with stables, big and small. ECW loves putting people in the groups. Sometimes any old randos could be part of a wrestler's entourage there. AEW today is lousy with them, borrowing from the New Japan model. And in WWE, three at a time is about as far as I like to go. Like all good things in wrestling, the success of those all-time great stables has sadly led to a lot of folks trying, and more often than not failing, to recapture lightning in a bottle. But me, I love myself a good faction. Like I've often mentioned on this channel, I became a fan in 1998, right in that sweet spot of DX vs. The Nation, the corporation beginning to form, and then there was the Job Squad. When I was a kid, I immediately gravitated toward this ragtag team that formed in November of 98, a trio of undercard guys who had to endure years of poor win-loss records and questionable gimmicks. It was one of the first real new angles I remember watching from its inception, so I was strangely invested in the successes and failures of the squad. Al Snow, Bob Holly, and Two Cold Scorpio got a couple of wins here and there and peaked when they helped Dwayne Gill beat Christian to become the light heavyweight champion, but overall it was truth in advertising as the lads were forced to look up the lights more often than not. The group officially ended in February of 99 after Snow and Holly famously brawled into the Mississippi River over the Hardcore Championship. It was witnessing the rise and fall of the job squad where I first learned about the idea of jobber stables, groups of guys who were basically there to exist as bodies for bigger stars and not much else. Shortly after the squad came and went, the WWF was blessed by the arrival of the Mean Street Posse. I use that term because what began as one or two appearances to help build the Shane McMahon X-Pac feud of early 99 turned into a full-time run for Rodney and Pete Gass. The two legit childhood friends of Shane O'Mac were the absolute definition of corporate nepotism when they impressed the higher up so much with their antics, they got to stick around and actually train to wrestle on the job. But as entertaining as they were, such luck had a ceiling. The group, which eventually added a third member in Joey Abs was mid-card fodder at best, and the guys were eventually phased out from the company after a run in developmental. And over on WCW, for example, they had the NWO B team. Forged out of the great NWO merger following the finger poke of doom, this is where all the riffraff went while Hogan, Hall, Nash, and the other real stars were in the Wolfpack elite. Guys like Stevie Ray, Vincent, Scott Norton, and Brian Adams rarely evoked praise or victories and spent more time fighting among themselves than anyone else in WCW. By the time Stevie won the right to lead the B-team, there was hardly an NWO worth representing. As a WCW entity, the B-team's crap booking was heavily referenced by its spiritual successor, the Alliance in 2001. Thank you! The point is, some stables are formed to build its members up, and others are formed to build those other guys up. This week we're looking through the best of the worst, wrestling's most infamous job-tastic stables through the years. <laughs> Let's start off strong, strongly terrible that is, the Million Dollar Corporation. Its 1994 debut was anything but auspicious. Ted DiBiase had recently come back to the Federation after a hiatus and being forced to retire due to a back injury. DiBiase's first charge as a manager was, who else, 47-year-old Nikolai Volkov. Essentially brought in as Virgil 2.0, DiBiase bought Nikolai's contract for the simple thrill of harassing and embarrassing him, even going so far as to put sense emblems on his gimmick. Things would improve slightly upon the arrivals of DiBiase's old partner IRS and Bam Bam Bigelow. It wasn't until that summer when the corporation became the main heel engine of the WWF when two major storylines revolved around them, Tatanka's heel turn on Lex Luger and the disastrous Undertaker vs. Underfaker match at SummerSlam. As the months went by, we saw IRS and Kama Mustafa fight the dead man over his urn, and even 41-year-old King Kong Bundy was dusted off to fight him. So wait, you're telling me that Ted DiBiase, who had always been portrayed as both 
both very rich and very smart, could only find guys like Volkov and Bundy for his super group, why not bring back Ken Patera and the Iron Sheik, making a Maccabia Mania reunion? The MDC gave fans some of the worst pay-per-view main events of 1995. Bam Bam Bigelow vs. Lawrence Taylor at WrestleMania comes to mind, as does the final match of the much maligned King of the Ring 95. Members cycled in and out with little fanfare, with everyone from Henry Godwin to Sid getting involved. Even the 123 Kid turned heel on Razor Ramon to join them. After it was all said and done, Steve Austin would be the final member of the Million Dollar Corporation in January of 96. But even that was short-lived as DiBiase was written out of the product after signing a deal with WCW. And speaking of which, stop me if you heard this one, okay? So, a Tongan, a Laughing Man, one of the Nasty Boys, a Karate Fighter, and a one-hit wonder from the 60s walk into a bar and they suck! It's the first family. Jimmy Hart's original first family was a longtime staple of Memphis wrestling, as it provided a steady stream of foils for Jerry Lawler to beat at the height of his popularity. Then came Hart's terrific managerial run in the WWF in the 80s and 90s, managing some of the best tag teams of the era. Compared to all that, WCW's half-hearted attempt at a family revival seemed like an afterthought, just a way to keep Jimmy happy, which, in turn, kept the Hulkster happy. The group formed out of the rubble of the Dungeon of Doom, another group of disposable goons, when Hart took Hugh Morris and the Barbarian and lumped them in with Jerry Flynn and Brian Knobs just because. The group lasted in some form or fashion from 1997 to 1999, but never had much to show for it. Untimely injuries kept derailing their momentum. Then finally, Vince Russo's arrival as the new head writer spelled the end of the group entirely, one of the only smart booking decisions of his entire WCW run. Besides the fact that no one from that group was going to set the world on fire, it felt like a big waste of time for everybody involved. And with the NWO still running around, that meant it was going to be an uphill battle for any heel team to get a foothold, injuries or not. Although Jimmy was great in his time, perhaps his involvement as the sneaky pipsqueak manager was holding the other members down. As good as he was in the role, his particular brand of management felt somewhat dated in a time where everything was getting grittier and more reality based. Hang on, did I just say grittier and more reality based? Time to take that idea to its next logical step. Race baiting! Yes, the gang wars. After seeing what the Nation of Domination and the Hart Foundation were doing, the WWF decided in the summer of 97 that everyone should be in a stable and they should all fight each other. In June of that year, Farouk fired Crush and Savio Vega from the Nation, and the ex-members wanted to form their own color-coded gangs in response. Crush formed the biker gang known as the Disciples of Apocalypse with Chains, Skull, and 8-Ball. Meanwhile, Vega built a team of fellow Puerto Ricans, Miguel Perez, Jesus Estrada, and Jose Castillo, known as Los Barricos. Was. Now you would think that a feud involving three men, which then expanded into a feud involving roughly a dozen men, would be about four times as exciting, right? <laughs> Wrong. While the nation moved on and eventually evolved, DOA and the Bariquas feuded endlessly and fruitlessly throughout 97, to the point where it was voted the worst feud of the year by readers of the Wrestling Observer. It's worth noting that this year was also the height of another group in the Truth Commission, but aside from maybe one or two encounters near the very end, the South African militants were nowhere near this action. Talk about a missed opportunity slash dodged bullet. Like so many other stables who are given that initial push before the higher ups lose interest, DOA and the Bariquas soon settle into a rut that was hard to get out of. DOA spent most of 98 feuding with the Legion of Doom, but the guys from Puerto Rico became a complete afterthought after Savio Vega left the company. Jose, Jesus, and Miguel were relegated to jobbing on shows like Shotgun and Super Astros before all leaving the company in September of 99. Now the gang wars might have flopped, but by no means was that the end of stables in the WWF. Less than a year later, they brought out a whole new group with an old crappy twist. Shane Douglas, one last word from you, pal. And they can all Kiss my ass! I thank my lucky stars that I began watching wrestling when I did, and not a moment sooner, because I may have been turned off entirely from watching the NWA invade the World Wrestling Federation. The historic governing organization that hadn't been relevant since breaking away from WCW five years earlier, who would surely provide the kick in the pants the WWF needed to finally beat that cool and edgy WCW in the ratings war. The invasion that was meant to restore honor to the WWF began at the very end of 97, with a four-minute match for the NWA North American title that saw Memphian Aztec warrior Jeff Jarrett defeat Black Jack Barry Windham. Then Steve Austin came out after the bell to hit Jarrett with a stunner and leave, killing the movement's credibility on day one. 
It's kind of cool the Rock and Roll Express have had somewhat of a career renaissance in the independence the last several years, considering how close they were to being deemed too far past their prime 24 years ago. But they, along with a newly turned Barry Windham, would join Double J and Cornette in their cause and were awarded the NWA World Tag Titles. Why JC would align himself with the team he had always feuded against back in the day is anyone's guess. But that was the least of their problems creatively, as most of the group's matches had bullshit finishes brought on by rampant cheating by Cornette. Oh yes! What a nice return to wrestling's roots this has been. Then out of nowhere, Jeff Jarrett up and left the group, the next nail in the coffin. You know the group is bad when its apparent star decides he'd rather go back to his Porter Wagner ripoff gimmick than be the North American champion. Cornette soon traded up when he replaced Morton and Gibson with the new Midnight Express of Bodacious Bart and Bombastic Bob. <sighs> I'm just saying, Bobby Eaton was still active during this time. You're telling me they couldn't have bought him away from Turner for this? Well, on second thought, it's probably for the best they didn't do that. And to make matters worse, even Dan Severn couldn't be bothered to spend long in the stable that bore the name of the organization of which he was the world's heavyweight champion. However, Severn debuting his immaculate theme music was the best thing to come out of this angle. The group's highest profile match came at King of the Ring 98 when the New Midnight lost a match for the WWF tag titles against the New Age Outlaws. Then Bart and Bob would fight each other in the brawl for all, Cornette would retire as a manager in protest, and that was it for the NWA until about four years later. I'm not saying it should have worked out, especially given the creative direction the company was heading during this time, but it could have worked out. Maybe if the wrestlers were given more time in their matches or had better finishes or more interesting feuds, things could have been better. But instead, the NWA storyline faded into the ether like the territories it was based on. If you want to talk about an invasion that worked, for a few weeks at least, then we have to jump way ahead in the timeline to talk about the Nexus. There's a whole video I've done on this from a few years ago, but here are the cliff notes. The first NXT NXT class unleashed hell on the main roster before losing their first big match at SummerSlam 2010. Nothing was on the line per se, but their trajectory took a huge, unrecoverable hit as a result. The team's collapse lasted almost four times as long as their ascent, constantly getting one-upped by guys like John Cena and Randy Orton, until finally CM Punk led a coup and kicked Wade Barrett out as leader. But before I touch on that, let's first show some love to the man, the legend, the one constant in so many of the next teams I'm going to talk about here, Heath Miller. The man once known as Heath Slater may have been one of the best hands WWE had in the last 15 years. Not only did he spend an awful long time in the company, he bopped around from jobber stable to jobber stable over the years as well. And they don't trust just anyone with that kind of creative. Slater would walk away from CM Punk's new Nexus, which was a good call since that version of the group somehow did even worse than the first. Instead, Heath and Justin Gabriel formed the core alongside Barrett and Ezekiel Jackson. The Bad Logo Boys did peak with some tag team and icy title wins, but then things fell apart after WrestleMania when they lost in less than two minutes the Big Show and Friends. The core crumbled in June of 2011, and after Heath spent years languishing in the lower card by himself, the time finally came for him to languish in the lower card with friends again. <laughs> That's right, party people, it's the three-man band. Slater, Jinder Mahal, and Drew McIntyre were three guys with zilch to do before they were thrown together and told to make it work. And despite counting a lot more lights than platinum records, the group managed to carve out their own special spot in history. No, it wasn't meant to be taken seriously, but the trio still created plenty of memorable moments, like the WLC match and... Okay, that was pretty much their biggest highlight, but that was still rad as hell. It's made all the more amazing when you realize that two out of three of its members are now former WWE champions, when at the time, that prize couldn't have been much further away from them. If you can come out the other side of that gimmick and continue to thrive, you're doing something right. 3MB ended unceremoniously in June of 2014, when Drew and Jinder were released in their contracts, leaving Heath all alone. Or was he? Fast forward another two years, Slater Gator had come and gone, and the one-man band had another team on the horizon with the Social Outcasts. Comprised of Slater, Curtis Axel, Adam Rose, and Bo Dallas, you might as well have called this group the Job Squad 2.0. At the time, these guys were some of the jobbingest jobbers to ever job, and much like their spiritual predecessors from 98, their luck did not improve once they became united. The Outcasts lasted for six months before the team was blown up in the 2016 draft, which famously ended with Slater being the one man on the whole roster who didn't get picked, but that's a whole other story. This next stable was, in my opinion, one of the worst in the last 10 years. It was horrific. It was heinous. You might call it an international incident. If it weren't for us putting up with these guys, we may never have been blessed with this. Acknowledge me. 
There's no way I was going to talk about WWE's recent history of shit teams and not bring up the League of Nations. Two former world champions and a pair of very talented mid-card acts joined forces in November of 2015 with the explicit intent of getting beaten up by Roman Reigns. The group formed soon after Sheamus used his money in the bank to beat Reigns the WWE title. He, Alberto Del Rio, Rusev, and Wade Barrett united for reasons that were never really explained besides that they were all from different countries and kind of hated America. This foursome was looking to make a statement, and they did just that in their second ever match together when they lost by countout to Roman Reigns in a four-on-one handicap match. Did I mention this was taking place during the time when they really wanted us to like Roman and would do almost anything to that end? This did not help. I get having your hero fight off a big threat, but what threat was there? Nothing evokes more of a threat in wrestling than four huge guys, one of which is the top champion, running away from one man in a flak vest. You know what's really sad? Vincent Mann got the fans to cheer for Reigns more than the full-time wrestlers ever could. Sheamus lost the title to Roman three weeks after winning it, while Del Rio traded the U.S. title back and forth to Kalisto. And besides their attempts to thwart the big dog of the 2016 Royal Rumble match, there was very little else for these guys to do as a collective unit. They managed to pick up a win against the New Day at WrestleMania 32 in Dallas, only to immediately get beaten up by Steve Austin, Shawn Michaels, and Mick Foley. Aw, it's almost like they mattered. The League of Nations took four guys and made them all look worse than before. And what's worse, they didn't even help make Roman Reigns any less hated. Truly one of the most frustrating things WWE had done creatively during that time period. Now, I don't want you to think this video is just being done for me to bash WWE. There are a lot more companies out there that have done dumb things with large groups of people. Take, for instance, AEW. Like I said at the start of the video, if there's one thing AEW knows how to do, it's make stables. For a time, it felt like a new group was debuting or forming every week, though things seem to be settling down as of this recording. And like any other company, AEW has already had its fair share of success and failure in that department. Two words, Nightmare Collective. Ugh. Is that a third word? One of the biggest head scratchers in the company's early existence was when Brandi Rhodes not only turned heel, but then got all weird and vaguely mystical as she and Awesome Kong would cut people's hair. They added Melanie Cruz and Luther to the mix, but by the time anything got going, Kong was too hurt to work. Their story and their motivations were already muddled as it is, not to mention most observers hated every second of this group on their screen. It just plain didn't work, which explains why Brandi hastily went back to normal in February 2020 as Cody was deep into his feud with MJF. Speaking of confusing and ineffective groups, how about the Hardy family office? When Matt Hardy reverted to his big money persona in early 2021, things began normally enough as he started to manage private party. Then along came Butcher and the Blade, then the Hybrid 2, and before you know it, Matt had a big old group of people around him. As members of the group went down with injury or lost more and more matches, the team felt a lot more jumbled and scattered. Then Andrade latched on to make things feel even more busy. But the AHFO carried on in a similar fashion to its previous version. After Revolution this past year, the group finally imploded when Andrade and Private Party turned on Matt. This beatdown brought about the AEW debut of Jeff Hardy, and well, that was fun while it lasted. A lot of AEW's characters have taken some interesting journeys these last three years, but I don't think one person or entity has had more growth for the better than the Dark Order. Today, the Dark Order is one of the most beloved factions in AEW, a living and loving tribute to the legacy of Brody Lee, full of colorful characters in their own right. They befriended Hangman Page and helped motivate him in his quest to win the AEW title. It was genuinely one of the nicest things about watching Dynamite for a time. But let's be honest, it is a far cry from what the group was first like when it debuted. What the Evil Uno and Stu Grayson, known in the indies as the Super Smash Brothers, made their mark on the very first AEW show, Double or Nothing 2019, flanked by their masked minions known as the Creepers. The group would wreak havoc on the roster while recruitment vignettes would air on TV. The group basically came off like a cult trying to target sad and angry dudes. They welcomed Alex Reynolds and John Silver into the group, which gave the team a bit more bite. But in a time where wrestling's full of dark and creepy gimmicks, the original Dark Order was a strangely odorless and flavor-free attack attempt to ride a trend instead of creating something fresh and vibrant. Having local talent under the hoods didn't help as it made the order look cheap and not to be taken seriously. The problems of the group came to a head on the final dynamite of 2019 when a sloppy, second-rate beatdown by the horde of masked extras exemplified all the hokiness AEW had originally set out to not do. I mean, for God's sake, what are you punching, kid? Considering the stable was running alongside the equally panned Nightmare Collective, it's kind of a wonder they didn't get blown up along with it. The Dark Order's decline was apparently a factor that led to Tony Khan taking over the booking duties and 
a storyline that promised to reveal the group's exalted one. Though some like myself scratched our heads at Mr. Brody Lee's original portrayal, his presence as the leader of the group absolutely right of the ship and made the Dark Order be taken much more seriously before his untimely passing. What began as one of the goofiest groups in AEW ended up becoming one of its best. <laughs> oh God! Oh, I can't believe I said that much bad stuff about AEW. Oh God, I'm so ashamed. I feel so filthy. I gotta DM Tony Khan right now and apologize this instant. Oh Lord, oh Lord, I'm so sorry. Just go to the next clip, please, please. Hello? Hey, you there. That's right, you, John Q. WrestleFan. Reject the corporate overlords. Quit sucking the tea of sports entertainment and put all your money into abeyance coin. Seriously, please do it soon. Papa needs to cash out. The pandemic was a strange time for all of us. Everyone in the world, let alone in wrestling, was flying by the seat of their pants trying to figure things out. It was a genuine low point, so WWE decided to match that energy with Retribution, one of the most ill-conceived, short-sighted ideas for a faction in the history of wrestling. In early August of 2020, a group of masked individuals created chaos at the Performance Center where all the shows were taking place. Hitting a generator with a Molotov cocktail, tearing down the set and taking a chainsaw to the ring, these folks were basically Vincent Mann's vision of Antifa. The fact that this angle was happening as protests were happening and riots were breaking out across America was a coincidence not lost on many. On the surface, Retribution was presented as a group of disenfranchised wrestlers who felt they hadn't gotten their fair shake in the company. But the vibe was a little tone deaf considering this was going on at the dawn of the great budget cut era. Maybe if the released wrestlers came back with this look it'd be one thing, but these were just poorly disguised NXT call-ups who hadn't even been on the main roster long enough to be disgruntled. If anything, these guys and gals should have thanked their sweet bippies they were still around. That's right, I said bippies! The wrestlers were all given very silly names. Dominic Dijakovic became T-Bar, Shane Thorne, Slapjack, Dio Madden Mace, Mia Yim Reckoning, and Mercedes Martinez as Retaliation. Oh, never mind, she asked to be removed from the group and was put back at NXT, so hopefully that turned out well for her. More pain, what a roundhouse kick! Yikes. So after weeks of fans asking why the hell have these folks not been arrested yet, the story finally hit a pivotal turning point that September when these violent anarchists bent on disrupting the corrupt system of WWE signed performer contracts with WWE. Fuck. What? What? That's right, these punk-ass crybabies abandoned their ideals the moment some money was thrown at them, then they were made to look like even bigger chump stains, losing the bulk of their matches and gaining no traction. It's like when Matt Hardy resigned with WWE in 2005, only instead of him, it was a bunch of people fans didn't care about. Then after all that, it was finally revealed that Mustafa Ali was the leader of the group, which led to even more losses until the team eventually ousted him as leader and went their separate ways. Look, the Spirit Squad may have killed the careers of all but one guy on that team, but shit, at least they won the tag titles, what do these guys get out of it except some crappy names? It was a storyline with a weak premise, a flimsy execution, zero payoff, and a ramshackle ending that wasted everyone's time and energy. In a business with a rich history of putting a bunch of people in a group and then doing nothing with them, Retribution has to rank up there as one of the most egregious examples. But hey, maybe it'll be some 13 year old kid's equivalent of the job squad. So what's your favorite group of lovable losers in wrestling? What stables did I miss? Let me know in the comment section below. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.